Hey y'all, it's your girl Aaron, and today I wanted to give you an introduction to egoist communism. In my opinion, almost everyone on earth would prefer to live in an egoist communist society instead of what we have now, or anything else for that matter. So if the words egoism or communism are giving you a cognitive dissonance when put together, I'm hoping I can resolve that for you in this video. But you're going to need to humor me for a bit. When people are claiming that egoism is like purely individualist and is pro-capitalist and stuff, then in my opinion they are the narco-capitalists of egoism. The reality is that Stoner did indicate that there was something that should be built together. Stoner was definitely for a socialist economy and would definitely fit into anarchist theory, although some would say post-anarchist. The everything is a phantasm meme people say. is also itself a phantasm and if that's the sum total of what someone's understanding of egoism is that's just nihilism with egoist language furthermore uh, just as many people have built upon the works of people like Marx or Kropotkin people have also built upon the works of Stoner If you are dismissing the ideology entirely, then you might be missing out on some of the good work that's being done. So individualism in summary would be the idea that to arrive at a working model of society, you need to focus on the individual and their own needs rather than on some kind of collective will or imposition. And then collectivism would be the idea that to arrive at a working model of society, you, you need people in society to agree to some collective goals or conditions, and that the individual is best served when they are cooperating with those collective goals. And so the key to today's video, I think, is this point now that individualism and collectivism are often framed as mutually exclusive as if they're opposite ends of a binary. And I think that that's extremely dangerous and that that framing can become a fixed idea to you. And, but in reality, individualism and collectivism are abstraction, social constructs, things created by humans, imagined into being. And so the, it's almost impossible for anything like that to be a binary. I would argue that on closer scrutiny, rather than these things being mutually exclusive, I think that they can't exist without each other. So let's have a look at some of the examples of individualism and collectivism that we've seen around us. Authoritarian individualism posits that the best possible society is one in which the individual acts in their own interests and that whatever results from this is preferable to not doing that. In other words, it's basically a society based on the idea that might makes right. And an example of that would be capitalism. And then authoritarian collectivism posits that in order for individuals to not harm each other, a collective will or conditions needs to be imposed upon the individuals. In other words, people can't get along together without some kind of authority or parents figure to supervise us and make sure that we are getting along well together. Um, and an example of this would be authoritarian state capitalists like the USSR or China. 
The issue here is that neither of these positions are liberatory. There's no good in having society where you have total autonomy in theory but can't leave your home without having to fear for your safety. And there's no use in having society with collective ideals if the individuals making up such a society are robbed of their autonomy in the process. So if you ask me, an individual who is abusing other individuals because there is no collective protections, and an individual who is abusing other individuals in the name of those collective protections are both illegitimate. And in response to this, we have three choices. Number one, we could repeat the failed attempts we've seen before, which would be the authoritarian individualism or authoritarian collectivism. But I think that that's an objectively bad choice to make because this sucks. Choice number two would be to become a status quo warrior and stick with that conflict between our competitive social structure and our cooperative human tendencies that we are all born with. So a status quo warrior is someone who's happy to look the other way when the atrocities in our current society are not threatening them personally, or so they think. So if we lived in a just society, being a status quo warrior wouldn't be such a bad thing. But under capitalism, it is indistinguishable from being an active oppressor. It's like the onlookers who do nothing while a bully abuses someone who is weaker than them. And then choice number three would be to attempt both and forge a synthesis of both individualism and collectivism. And so, for example, just like how you synthesize socialism and libertarianism to create libertarian socialism, and we, what you end up with is distinct from the two parts that you started with, you can forge collectivism and individualism together to form an individualism that functions in a collective manner but also being a form of collectivism that does not impose any generalized expectations on individuals, but treats them as individuals. No worries about laws that may not be ethical in certain unforeseen complicated situations, because each person is having their unique individual needs and actions responded to, not whether they match up to some predetermined acceptable norm. Uh, we can call this combination of things collectivist individualism or individualist collectivism, but while that does communicate the point, it does lose a bunch of nuance if your idea of collectivism is specifically communist or your idea of individualism is specifically egoist. For example, socialist egoism, not capitalist egoism. So to keep that nuance in there, we can simply use the terms that already apply to the specific synthesis, egoist communism. So if you disagree with me so far, of course that's fine. Uh, but I just wanted to say that this kind of egoism and communism is what a lot of egoists and communists are referring to. So just like how libertarian socialists would claim that only a socialist form of libertarianism is tolerable and that only a libertarian form of socialism is tolerable, similarly in my opinion at least we should argue that only the egoist form of communism is tolerable and only the communist form of egoism is tolerable. And while we are not going to get people to associate one with the other easily, if this is an effective application of language as I think it is, it can help us to combat the narrative that they are a binary or are mutually exclusive. How many times have you told someone you think we should do communism and they got super upset with you because they were thinking about the authoritarian form of communism? But if you were to tell them instead that you were interested in egoist communism, then they might be a little bit more interested in hearing what that is and how it's different from authoritarian communism. Of course, it's, it's a communism that doesn't have states or laws. And to be honest, if we look at political theory closely, we can already find an individualist form of communism. It's what people call full communism where an egoist communist and another type of communist might disagree is in how we get there. But both egoist communists and those who want full communism are talking about a communism that is classless and stateless, where individual liberty is maximized as far as possible without it being at the expense of collective unity. Classless and stateless society, while still being collectivist, would necessarily also be individualist too, as there would be no way of enforcing any of the collective structures upon people without class or state. Likewise, if we look for a collectivist form of individualism, we come across Stirner's Union of Egoists, which similar to how socialism and libertarianism 
have had almost entirely the opposite concepts attributed to those names, uh, so individualist conceptions of egoism have been attributed to egoism as if that was what Stoner intended. And a closer look at egoism uncovers that it too, like full communism, ends up being both collectivist and individualist, as Stoner points out that in a connected society, the lack of individual autonomy in some necessitates a lack of individual autonomy in others, as without such, the lack of autonomy could be immediately rectified. In other words, in denying someone else their individuality, the oppressor is denying their own individuality too, and a society which allows for the oppression of others in this way is one where everyone has collectively abdicated some of their individuality to the abstraction that is oppressing those people. In other words, in a society where there will undoubtedly be people who want there to be social justice, that for social injustice to exist, there needs to be a society-wide system where those who would seek to restore justice can be repressed. In modern society, we see this in the functioning of the state and how the law itself, as well as the law enforcement, is always concerned more with the abstract ideals of protecting claims to property or suppressing activism rather than trying to solve inequality. More and more, this kind of oppression is being carried out by non-state organizations like for-profit security firms. Though. So in order for there to be a society where the individual is able to truly act autonomously and in their own interests, each individual person within that society will need to have that freedom too and to use it in autonomously agreeing to cooperate with others instead of competing with them, to voluntarily collectivize without there being any mechanisms present and so to force such a collectivization on them. The only form of individualism that can actually work is one that internalizes the values of collectivism into each individual. And so while egoism can only actually ever be implemented in a collectivist way, and so voluntarily, without falling apart, so I would argue communism can only actually be achieved in an egoist way. Society will need to make its foundations the understanding that the only form of collectivism that will work is one way people have internalized the values of treating other people as individuals, and the only way to guarantee people personal liberties is if they opt into some collective methods or protocols of interacting with each other. But once society has internalized and crystallized these values into our culture, we won't need to put much work into maintaining this arrangement. It will come naturally to us, but it's getting there that is the hard part, and it will be the single greatest project our species has ever attempted.
it will be incredibly difficult to convince people that we need to choose to cooperate with each other without there being any authoritarian mechanisms to force them to do so. And they will need to be able to resolve conflicts without any appeals to judiciary or authority. And this is why egoism is important to communism, as it gives us the tools with which to untangle the dogma and fixed abstractions that might be standing in opposition to making such a choice, uh, holding them back from accepting it because they see it as sacred. Essentially, we will all need to learn to deconstruct our own reasons for what we believe. But just like how we have learned to communicate with each other in new ways thanks to technology, like with the maymays, and as we have had to learn new dialects and ways of communicating ourselves in these new mediums without having full sensory bandwidth with which to add the nuance to our language. So we can also all learn, I think, how to deconstruct our own beliefs. And it's a skill that we need to learn if we want society where we can resolve conflicts without any higher power to mediate between us. So like under capitalism, we have to learn certain skills too, like how to manage money, how to navigate bureaucracy. So in an egoist communist society, uh, I think it's an okay requirement that we have something to learn as well. And that would be to be able to deconstruct our motivations and the demands that certain arguments make of us uh, so that we don't submit to them, but are able to work out what the best thing is with, with everyone around us. Um, when conflicts happen, whether the agreed upon resolution is optimal or not is irrelevant, when the people there have unpacked it, seen the moving parts, and come to an agreement with all of the information there, free from suspicions of hidden motives, etc., because they've all had the uh, arguments laid bare before them, and in the reconciliation process, there might be an agreement to some restorative processes, but there shouldn't be any grudges being held because you would have had a mutually agreed upon resolution. Uh, what egoism advocates for is that nobody subsumes any of their will to an external abstraction because it is in this submission to some external abstraction that people's individualness, uniqueness, gets alienated, allows those abstractions to be leveraged to create class in society. Um, no abstraction could ever encompass the full diversity of the participants in society and the full combinations of interaction between them. You can't ever fit the real interactions of people into an abstraction. So what we'll need to do is be able to figure those things out ourselves as we go, rather than referencing a huge manual. We'll need to be able to figure out the best action in those specific situations. Uh, so that's kind of the theory behind egoist communism. But how would that translate into the practical real world? Uh, you might be thinking that you want some examples. And so um, I don't know if you've ever played a board game or a tabletop game with some friends, and maybe you've come across a misunderstanding about the rules in the game. And so your first way of trying to resolve it might be to chat amongst yourselves and see if anyone can agree. And if you don't agree, then you can always go and have a look at the manual, see what the manual says, and then you can decide from there what to do. But what is important is to have fun playing the game together. You should really only be spending tons and tons of time figuring out specific rules if figuring out the rules is fun for people. If it's not, then you're much better off just making a quick house rule and getting on with the game. And so that's an instance where um, the individuals have to choose to cooperate together and when they do they they all enjoy the experience but if one individual is not cooperating then it messes the the game up for everyone and no one can have fun and so egoist communism would say that do not treat the rules as authoritative or any one specific player it's more important is to mold the best collective experience in that moment to see what everyone else is into is there anyone there that's going to be put off by long rule searches? Then don't do that, rather accommodate them. And that's an example of where free association is important because uh, free association would allow people to gravitate to whichever group of game players they, 
most enjoyed playing the game with. And then for another example of a system where individual autonomy follows some collective guidelines but is still resilient to individual differences in operation, uh, that would be something like a traffic circle where uh, everyone is driving a different type of car with a different pull-off speed and reaction time but it flows most efficiently when everyone is getting a turn to go and without having to wait too long or taking too long to pull off. So people are able to keep traffic flowing if they follow some basic guidelines which is to slow down a bit and to always give way to the same side. And that allows everyone with whatever type of transportation they're using to interact with each other and if anyone is messing up and causing a backup in traffic then you have your horns to try and communicate to them and hopefully they realize uh, what everyone else is expecting of them and can get on with it. So um, I think that's, that's kind of a, an example where you need to have uh, individuals um, co-opting into some collective guidelines that they would choose to do even without there being any authority system in place simply because they understand that, that that's the most effective way for traffic to be flowing through the intersection. And then another example, and one I think that is even more adept than the previous ones, and that is of an improv jazz band. So for example, that is something that by definition requires an interaction between individuals collectively so that the end result is something harmonious. In fact, if one of the individuals in a jazz band makes a mistake, there's incentive for the rest of the band to adapt what they're playing to accommodate for that so that it doesn't sound like it was a mistake. That's exactly the kind of active cooperative participation that an egoist communist society is arguing for. One where we have learned to play well together, where we're not just interested in dazzling the audience with flashy solos, but we want to contribute our individual labors where it would be most effective when combined with others. So the individual is only able to look good when the collective is sounding good. The collective will try to use their own individual actions to accommodate the other individual. So if only one person in the band played, then the crowd would leave because they came there to hear a full band. But there's no predefined composition or music sheets for them to follow. Each member in the band has to use their own autonomous actions to add to the sound the best they know how, so that collectively it sounds good. And when it sounds good collectively, then, then the audience is able to see the value in the individuals who are participating in it. One individual playing out of key would result in the entire band being perceived as not sounding good. Egoist communists want a society where nobody is being oppressed because suffering and oppression would be like somebody playing out of key. And so we would use our individual actions to correct that dissonance. Um, our collectivist theory can describe for us what kind of sounds people like hearing, like giving each instrument space to be heard, appropriate volumes, and while the more individualism focused theory can help us to figure out how to improve our own playing, uh, that would be something like learning scales or chords and learning the ways of arranging ourselves together so that we can have positive synergies. So in my opinion, that's really what makes me think this is something worth pursuing, because I see us already handling these highly nuanced cooperative feats simply for the enjoyment or efficiency that comes from those arrangements. I see no reason for that not to be how we can get everything done, especially if it's going to address a lot of the problems in society, problems that are discordant in their very existence. We can organize ourselves this way. It's not really that hard to do once you've had enough practice. It can be very scary if all you've ever done is taken the bus or played off sheet music, but the abstractions people have used to try and arrange society are what is killing it. And we are species with far too much inherent autonomy and diversity that these abstractions like capitalism or the gender binary or the state are holding back the full human potential. And we are tired of the same three chord songs over and over. We want to be able to play the tunes within ourselves. So if we're going to get there, then there's a couple things we need to do. We need to both learn how to play well in a band 
This means adjusting our behavior and thinking so that we can stop being out of key. Or to put it another way, we need to be intersectionally self-critting to make sure that we are tuned to the right key. And additionally, we need to have confidence in each other that the hard work we're putting in to be in key is going to be put in by everyone else so that they'll also be in key. And the difficulty in achieving an egoist communism isn't in the complexity of the theory or practice, but it is in learning to be harmonious with one another and abandoning the societal training wheels that we've been using and getting hurt with. There's no need to categorize all the ways capitalism is screwing us over because the capitalists will be coming up with new ones tomorrow and will never keep up. Rather, we should spend our time on figuring out how to play together harmoniously and then convincing all the people who are out of key to start putting in the maintenance of their personal ideology, get them to stop outsourcing their thinking and conflict resolution to institutions like music sheets and to play whatever it is that they feel will contribute best to the song that everyone else is creating. The more practice people have in self-determination and cooperation, the less scary it will become to play in a band, or drive through a traffic circle, or have a society without capitalism or the state. Egoist communism doesn't see the difficulty of achieving liberty as simply needing the people to become woke or aware of a class war. Rather, the difficult part will be in convincing everyone in society to care about the sound they're putting out, to start self critting so that they can play in key and to keep doing that until the point where everyone is willing to work together in cooperation instead of competition. One of the ways we can encourage people to do this though is to describe or if possible begin to live out that kind of society. Knowledge that something better is possible gets way more real when you see it for yourself. And that can spark action rather than incapacity that hopelessness brings. By teaching people how to live beyond capitalism, beyond the law, we open up the possibility of real liberation, change in the right direction for once, and which can't come from institution. We want people to become ungovernable not because they suddenly hate the idea of the state, but because they know that they are going to be able to arrange things better between themselves than the state ever could. I would argue that if your goal is a communism where everyone's individual autonomy is respected, then the kind of communism you're thinking of is egoist. And if your idea of egoism is a society where no hierarchies or alienation of individuality exists, the kind of egoism you're thinking of is communist. And referencing egoist communism as separate from an individualism-only egoism or a collectivism-only communism can be a good idea. Egoist communists call this individually cooperating collective of individuals, the union of egoists. The synthesis then of individualism and collectivism is in saying that without some kind of harmonious collective arrangement, there is no true individual experience. And without an individual opting in of a collectivism, it's not going to be collectivism that is healthy for the individuals in it. It will have to rely on coercion, which will create class distinction anew. So egoist communism doesn't suggest any kinds of shortcuts. All the same community level grassroots support for socialism and autonomy will need to be done as with the usual libertarian socialist ideologies. It's just a way to put emphasis on the specific benefits that egoism brings to the left. I mean, when people say that they want an anarcho-communist society or full communism in a libertarian socialist sense, 
I assume that we are talking about the same thing as when egoists talk about the union of egoists. And I think we all want that same thing. I think we're all bringing our own perspectives on which aspects of that thing are the most important. As someone who was raised with a lot of unhelpful beliefs, this is the right emphasis for me to be embracing so that I can deprogram those harmful ideas. But for you, it may not be something you feel is worth emphasizing yourself. But if you don't feel like we're talking about the same thing, then I encourage you to tell me why, and maybe we can figure out what the differences are. I think the discoveries in neuroplasticity over the past 50 years suggest that it is indeed possible for us to change our perspectives. Our brains are plastic. And hopefully this was understandable. There's so much more to egoist communism and I hardly got into any of the actual theory, but I wanted to at least map out where it is because I think it's something that needs to get a lot more attention and support. And I get annoyed when I see people dunking on a straw man version of egoism just because they came across a reactionary egoist edgelord or didn't perceive any anti-capitalism within Stoner's work, which myself and other egoists would say would absolutely be present there. But anyway, if you like this, feel free to share it with all of your friends or leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Okay, I finally finished this video. Um, I started making this video more than a year ago. I was actually still even married back then. You can see I'm wearing a ring in the video and all that. And uh, it just took so much work to finish that I couldn't manage to get it done. But I just want to really thank the people who have been supporting me on Patreon recently, who have really inspired me to sort of believe in myself again and um, see what my opinions are as valuable. So uh, I thought I would try and finish this video and I think that it came out pretty cool. So yeah, please share it if you, if you think it is interesting and yeah. Think, thanks for watching.